everybody. I'm Eric Hernandez, uh, superintendent for the school district. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, hopefully, this uh, presentation gives you an opportunity to learn more about what we're doing uh, school safety-wise. Um, also, give you an opportunity to ask some questions at the end as well. Okay? Can first of all, can everybody hear me? Okay? Okay. So again, welcome, Mayor Hernandez. Superintendent for the Forest Area School District, joining me this evening to uh, give an update about school safety and our changes in, in process and protocol. Um, I'll have the chief introduce you guys want to come on to the stage and introduce yourselves. I'm Chief Dan Bursa for the Forest Police Department. I'm Officer Sean Hughes, I'm the School Resource Officer with the Forest Police Department. Sergeant Bob Bird with the Forest Police Department. Uh, Pete Wilson, Director of Administrative Services for the School District. So why are we here this evening? Well, first and foremost, um, the safety of our students and our staff is a, is a top priority for the school district. Um, we're always considering uh, ways to improve our safety protocol, uh, whether we're talking about how we should maybe do fire drills or tornado drills, um, or how to deal with uh, the potential for an active threat we're, we're always annually having conversations about what, what do we need to do to ensure safety of our students and staff. Um, to, tonight, we're specifically talking about active threats as it, uh, when we talk about school safety. Um, when we talk about active threats, uh, it's really, unfortunately, that's the reality in our world today. Um, there are acts of violence that occur, uh, not just in school, uh, but, you know, as you watch the news over the last several decades, we have, unfortunately, acts of violence occur at the mall, at movie theaters, at churches. Um, so, as a safety committee that involves law enforcement, fire, EMS, and school administration and staff, you know, we want to make sure that we are um, aware of how to not only react to active threat situations, but also how, can, how might we be able to be proactive in so we are moving to change our protocol. Many of you are probably familiar with terms like hold lock secure, lockdown, things like that. Um, we're changing our, our response. And part of the reason we're changing our response to specifically active threats um, is because when you look at the response time for law enforcement to, to come to a, a, an act of violence at a school, um, we're very fortunate to have a local PD that can be here within minutes, but for those of you who've ever been in the middle of a crisis, whatever it might be, minutes, seconds can feel like an eternity. So what we decided is that we needed to evolve our response and that really school staff, and in some cases students, we have to be the first responders. So what we've taught all the the uh, staff at all the schools, which is actually unprecedented when we went through it for the uh, school in service earlier this year for staff uh, at all schools in the district. And that was all staff, all teachers, administrators, right down to the, the lunch ladies on what we can do to try and make everybody on the same page when it comes to school safety. What we taught them basically was the, and we'll get into the, the nuts and bolts of uh, this option based philosophy but run, fight, hide, whatever you want to call it, but giving them options. And, but we taught them that this isn't just for schools. This is for every day. When you're at the mall, when you are uh, at church, you could be in a group of people. Just letting people understand that they have some different options other than becoming a victim. And a lot of these things that uh, we taught them, they felt empowered. The feedback we got after the, uh, the presentation or the training that we gave, uh, how many, 300 plus? Uh, 400 staff members of the school district is, I've never felt so empowered in my life because now I know that I can, I can, I feel that I have options, I feel empowered, I feel safer. And that was great to get that feedback from people. And a lot of this is planning before uh, an event happens and basically letting them know, okay, well, what if something happens right now, what are your options? And we can all learn even in this, this uh, uh, group of people. You're at a mall, you're at a movie, and what if something bad happens? You know, we always think the guy with a gun or just something unbelievable happens. What are your options? Can I run out that door? 
Can I secure this door? You know, what are my things? Can I defend myself? That's kind of what the options-based philosophy started as. Yeah, it really is. And the, the way that we really presented this is that this is a life skill. It's, it's kind of teaching a survival mentality and just being prepared and understanding your surroundings is ultimately what we want our staff to be um, aware of them and what they were kind of trained and prepared for. So now the challenge for schools is those of you, if you remember back to your school days or um, work in schools or around schools, is you know we're, we're we really like order. As a former teacher, as a former principal, currently as a superintendent, we like order. You walk into an elementary school, we like straight lines, right? We talk about kids getting into straight lines. Um, we want to know directions to a project. What's the first step, second step? That's something that's really difficult for us to kind of break that mindset when we're talking about how do you respond in a moment of crisis or to an active threat. Um, and that, that's challenging because for teachers, I can tell you uh, in particular, uh, not having that order, um, that step A to step Z approach is challenging. So we're, that, that's that loss of control. Um, we want to be able to free them and let them know that we trust their judgment, they're going to make good decisions, and any decision is better than no decision. Any action is better than no action. So um, obviously partnerships are really critical, um, and I can just tell you, um, I've worked in a couple other school districts, and the partnership between the school district, the DeForest Police Department, the County Sheriff is just, I, I haven't seen it anywhere else. It's really strong. And so as we do this planning, really coming together as a team and talking through um, different scenarios and, and, and doing that action planning. So as part of our first steps, all last school year, if you go click to the next slide, we had um, what we call the Active Threat Subcommittee. We have a, a, a fairly large district safety committee made up of teachers, administrators, emergency responders from all over the district. Um, what we decided to do last year is really focus a small group, and you can see it's mostly administration and law enforcement. Um, that was really deliberate. Um, and so that was done in a way because we really, because of this shift, and as um, Eric just mentioned, um, schools are orderly places. We really wanted our staff and, and our community to know that leadership-wise, we were all on the same page and we're working on this together. So we deliberately worked as, as a leadership team um, to look at different scenarios and what, was, what would be the best fit for the DeForest Area School District community. Um, just so you guys know, I mean, you may or may not know, um, Windsor Elementary and Morrisonville Elementary are outside of the DeForest uh, Police Department jurisdiction, so that's where Dane County comes into play. So um, we've had some very active participation, specifically with um, Deputy Longley, uh, who does training all over the county, but again, the DeForest Police Department as well has been phenomenal. So, as I said, School safety has always been a priority, right? We review, we um, consider school safety when we look at construction. So this, this change or our evolution towards an options-based response um, isn't something that just happens when we talk about that partnership. We, we always are thinking about school safety um, as school administration. Um, even when you look at our new construction, uh, we think about safety and security of our students and staff in our new buildings. Uh, both Windsor and Eagle Point were in the kind of design phase, were designed so that we can close off sections of the building that was intentional. Um, we designed, you know, we redesigned uh, Yahara's entrance so that you would have to funnel visitors and guests and anybody entering the building towards the office. Um, so we're always kind of thinking about ways that we can consider and improve uh, school safety process and even within our facilities. We are going to be entering into a, a new facility study. Uh, part of that's driven because of our continued growth. Um, you know, as we get more kids into, into our system, particularly at the elementary level, they're going to be middle school and high schoolers, so we need to start planning ahead. Uh, how do we accommodate that um, enrollment growth? Uh, but school safety is always going to be part of those conversations, whether we're talking about how do you design your building so that there's appropriate sheltering, um, enough exits for fire drills or for fires, and for instances where we need to be able to evacuate or make some judgments about um, an active threat. 
So as uh, Superintendent Runesh and uh, Chief Fritz have, have already covered, you know, the skills and the option-based stuff that we taught staff is not only applicable to school, uh, it's applicable to everyday life. Unfortunately, in law enforcement and some of the ways that we do things, we learn from past events, okay? Um, and we create these paradigm shifts. And active threats at education facilities date back uh, generations. They, they've been going on for almost ever as people have been um, putting in mass areas. So it's just with advancement, technology, people start to learn about it, they take focus on it, and say, how can we change it to reduce casualties? What we, we have to understand is we're talking about one of the greatest um, uh, domestic terroristic threats that our country sees when something is enacted in a, in a school um, mass casualty or a mass casualty anywhere uh, for that instance. Uh, Columbine was one of the biggest shifts that we saw in how law enforcement responds to a critical incident, uh, critical incident such as an active shooter or active threat at a school. Uh, prior to Columbine, law enforcement would respond. The patrol uh, officers would set up a perimeter. They would radio what they saw. They would wait for um, the special weapons tactic teams or SWAT teams or uh, TRT teams show up, and they would make their entry. Unfortunately, um, active incidences are usually over uh, through history has taught us 16 minutes or less. Um, the average response time for uh, a SWAT team is about an hour and a half. An hour in our area if everybody's together and trained. So law enforcement said, we gotta do something different. Well that created this shift where now patrol officers were empowered to enter in smaller teams to confront uh, an adversary to save lives. Basically, the concept and the theory was the faster we can get in, uh, our actions on contact, the more lives we can save, okay? This is not your traditional police response, just like it's not the traditional response for your children's teachers on how they're gonna act. We still have our traditional everyday 99.9% .9 of stuff that we're gonna do, but it's that 0.1% where we need to prepare and have our staff empowered. So we had some things that we decided to do uh, nationally, we put it in place uh, post Columbine, and then the, uh, the Sandy Hook tragedy hit. Now this was one of the largest domestic terrorist threats that we saw since 9-11, okay? The largest we've seen in any type of educational institution. And they follow the, the old adage uh, of the whole lock and secure. Uh, that's where the, the bulk of the casualties came from. So we st stood back, uh, education professionals, and law enforcement professionals and said we got to do something different, okay? We need to change this so we can reduce, reduce the amount of casualties that occur in these dynamic situations. So then we empowered school, we empowered law enforcement to get together, to come together, coexist, and say, okay, how can we do this? What is a way for us to do this to be better? Now, this continues to go, okay? This continues to happen, to, uh, happen continues to evolve. Um, if you want, if you listen to any part of the news from Friday till today, uh, you know we become a little numb to it. They just had an incident in Reedsburg, where they uh, there was reported um, that a student was talking about enacting in uh, an active threat situation at one of the schools, and the student was arrested. So this stuff it happens. Uh, that's why we need to empower. Uh, we felt we needed to empower the school staff and create a partnership and build the bridge between school staff and law enforcement so we could respond appropriately to, uh, to help your kids and, and keep your kids safe in the, while they're in school. And, and as Sergeant Bird mentioned, you know, as their response has changed from a real organized, methodical, wait till everybody gets there, to today where uh, if you have one officer ready to enter, they can enter that quickly. Um, schools have to do the same thing. They've had to do the same thing over the last several decades and review what are our responses to an active threat and make those uh, same kind of evol evolutionary changes. So we continue to evolve. Uh, a couple things that we're, we've done going into this new school year is we're kind of changing our mindset with our staff, uh, empowering them. Uh, we're focusing on prevention as well, trying to have them be proactive. And then the final options-based response, you've heard us kind of talking about that. Um, we're fully implementing that. We, we've had a couple of training before the school year with all staff. Um, and then over the next probably several weeks, 
our intent is to start informing our students about how this change um, has been implemented in, in our schools. So we talked about a, a changing mindset. Again, um, most of us have gone through some sort of K-12 education. Um, and you know the traditional approaches were described earlier where um, you go into a lockdown where you're really closing, closing and locking the doors and just kind of um, getting down and being quiet. And that in some cases may well still be accurate, but that's a very passive response. So um, really this shift in philosophy is moving from that passive response to the active response and, and really empowering staff based on the situation at hand to in some cases go into a lockdown, in some cases do some other sort of technique to keep the students and themselves safe. So um, really talking about that, but again, the, the last bullet point to me is really important. This is a life skill, and unfortunately there are events that take place outside of schools and malls, public areas too, that again, just being aware of your surroundings and being aware of, um, you know, Officer Hughes and, and others have, have talked about examples about um, when they go out to, to dinner with their wives about really checking the scenario, making sure if something were to happen in the restaurant, how they can get out and how their wives initially were like, what's going on? And, um, but it's really, it's thinking in that way, not just in schools, but, but in other um, contexts as well. And, um, and I, want to, I want to point, we're not talking about like promoting fear, that is very different. Okay? It's not about we live in fear, it's about just being prepared, being aware of your surroundings and your situation, knowing what options you have in the event. And again, uh, generally speaking, when you look at statistically, even though it seems like there's been a lot of, of acts of violence over the last couple decades, schools are still the safest place to be. Schools are safe. All right, so trusting your instincts. So we have, we have a picture of a, of a squirrel up here, and, and you guys know from driving around or walking around, you see you know, squirrels are always looking around and things like that. We're not, we're not expecting staff and, and students to be all twitchy and things like that, but just being, being really aware of what's going on, looking for things that might not seem normal or things that may seem out of place, and just being aware of that. Um, we based some of this on some different research. Um, the Gift of Fear was, is, is a fairly well-known book by Gavin DeBecker. And I'm just curious, I've asked every, every staff group, has anyone ever been struck by a lightning in here? We have three people in the district who've been struck by lightning. But um, you may have heard, supposedly, and I don't know if this is true or not, but your body, like every hair on your body is supposed to stand up the minute before you get struck by lightning. We have two of the three confirmed that, that that is what happens. But it's this physiological response to fear, and that's what De Becker talks about in his book, is um, just being aware, and sometimes even your body triggers something's not right, something's, you know, and we're encouraging staff or students to, to respond if, if, they're, if they're feeling in that way and let someone know. Um, another example is, again, first impressions of a situation should be taken into account. Um, Malcolm Gladwell wrote, wrote Blink, which is a really, one of, one of his points talks about what's called thin slicing, or that initial, that first impression, not always, but many times, has a, has a significant amount of truth to it. So really talking to staff and kids about if something seems out of place, saying something to someone about it. Um, and then the key is prevention. We have um, lots of different safety procedures that haven't changed. Um, we have secure entrances in and out of schools. Um, we talk to staff and review with staff on um, a, a very regular basis, talking about um, you know, building doors, making sure that visitors are checking in and out, um, and getting visitor badges. So just making sure that we're, um, as staff, making sure we're following the normal, um, district safety protocols and procedures. And then the second point here is technology. Um, especially with social media being so out and about nowadays is many times the different you know events that have happened in the past there's been some sort of hint whether it's on social media or whether someone emails something um, and so we're again encouraging staff if you, if you see something out there if students see something out there they report it and then many times that has that has prevented potential dangerous or, or worse situations so as uh, Dr. Bolton shared, you know, what we, we also want to be proactive, right? I mean, we are making a conscious uh, approach to be proactive. Uh, these signs here, see something, say something. 
that's something that you'll find throughout all of our schools. Um, I, I know I'm speaking for Chief, and I, I can speak for the school board and administration here. We would much rather follow up and investigate um, a concern by a parent or a student and find out it was nothing or a complete misunderstanding than for someone to be kind of like, I don't know if I should just mention that or not. It's okay. We really do want to encourage um, encourage that. We, you know, that really our safety, school student, safety of students, um, is is really dependent on everyone being part of this. Um, you know, actually, if you travel now, just see something, say something. That's a homeland security motto. There doesn't matter where you go, and where there's lot large congregations of people, they really do uh, encourage that. So, in fact, I, I was in uh, Las Vegas last April, and you know they have all those giant digital signs in front of hotels. <coughs> which one it was? Maybe the, I kind of remember which one it was. Flash. See something. Say something. To me. So that's that's a very common thing, and we really here within the district want to adopt that and empower people. You know, when when something in your gut says that you've seen that seems wrong, it's okay to let us know. As I said, we would happily investigate it and find out it was just a misunderstanding. So why are we moving to an options-based approach? Uh, primarily, what we've seen is uh, over the last several decades is as police have changed their response, schools have to change their response. Um, and these changes, these evolutions, um, are intended to make schools more secure and, most importantly, save lives. <coughs> so some of the current statistics, again, Sandy Hook was really a game changer in the last, within the last decade. Um, uh, SRO Johnson, our previous SRO officer, uh, you know, he shared that in Sandy Hook, there were students who ran past the gunman and because they didn't stop and freeze. And that in some cases, uh, the worst casualties occurred where um, staff and students kind of followed protocol, which was that you kind of hunker down, get into one big group, and that just isn't, uh, that's not something we want to promote anymore. If there is an active threat, we really want to trust adults um, and even kids to use their best judgment and do whatever it takes to, to secure their safety and the safety of others. Part of that driving force is that, you know, again, we're very fortunate to have an outstanding partnership and have an outstanding uh, PD here locally that can be in any of our buildings within minutes. Um, Pete mentioned that uh, the jurisdiction for the Dane County Sheriff's is Morrisonville and Windsor, but I guarantee you, and the Chief will guarantee you, that if anything's happening in either one of those buildings, you're going to have the Forest PD there, maybe even faster because the Dane County covers, the Sheriff's County covers a lot of the larger area, really. So it's a really coordinated effort. Absolutely. Um, just to, to piggyback on that, um, law enforcement at least Dane County wide, we work in a partnership as well. Um, so rest assured, if you have your kids, if your kiddos go to Morrisonville or Windsor, we're coming, okay? Um, we have a thing in Dane County, uh, it's Capmark. Help me out, Chief, it's a capital area. Capmark? Uh, yeah. Uh, capital area police mutual aid. Thank you. Um, basically what that is, it's a really fancy way to say that if something happens here in the forest, in Windsor or in Morrisonville, and we need people, we just call out that acronym, and there's pre-established lists that people are coming. Cops are coming. Um, you know, I hate to kind of pick at, at old wounds and scabs, but you know, we did have an incident here uh, a while back in the forest at one of our schools. Um, I think uh, within five minutes we had close to 40, 50 officers here. In five minutes or less, I would argue. Within about the first minute, we had 15 to 20. And about 15 min minutes into it, we had close to 75 officers here uh, throughout Dane County. I mean, from Madison, Wanakee, Sun Prairie was on the way, State Patrol, uh, our, our agency, um, and, and, and a bunch of other agencies. So we are taking precautions too, again, because we have this paradigm shift in law enforcement. Uh, we have our partnerships and we're unified uh, now in a three tier with the school district bringing it to a fourth year with the unanimous parents being on board with what's going on. But even as quickly as law enforcement and our first responders can get to a building, um, it's still several minutes, and which is why we, school staff, and 
our schools have to react and be responders and be prepared to, you know, use that last bullet point. Because we're, our job is to buy time and to uh, secure safety as much as possible. So we're moving to an options-based response. Um, and we're going to very simple language. Uh, what, you're, what kids in the protocol now in schools, in our schools, is we're going to call a hold and secure, or in situations of, of actual active threat, it's options-based. With the hold and secure, to be honest with you, um, those will be called for a variety of different reasons. Uh, it might be we get a call from law enforcement saying there's a, there's a domestic issue occurring a couple blocks away. Why don't you keep any incoming and outgoing traffic out of, of the school? So we just you know call hold and secure. We might call a hold and secure because there's a medical emergency. Um, you know, a student faints or there's a, an injury and we want to keep the hallways clear so that way when the EMS arrives, they can quickly get, um, you know, to wherever that medical emergency is. Uh, we might call it because there's a, a child in crisis or um, a, a loose dog walks into the building. There's lots of very valid kind of, I don't want to call them everyday, but more um, normal reasons why we will call a hold and secure. Okay? And the reason we're doing that is because there, when we want to hold and secure, we really do want to secure the building. Um, everyone has to be in their classroom, but they continue class as normal. We're just, we're just eliminating traffic in the hallways and really monitoring or eliminating, quite honestly, traffic going in and out of the building. Um, we might have a medical emergency that is in one section of the building, and we might just say that's the only place that's hold and secure at this time. Um, again, that is so we can kind of maintain control and the orderliness of the school. In the event of, uh, of an actual active threat, there's not going to be a code call. There's not, we're not going to yell any, anything um, in specific language. It is what we've instructed staff is they're picking up the PA system and they're sharing as much detail as possible. If they know that there is a uh, bad guy dressed in um, gray pants and a blue shirt and a purple tie, you know, walking uh, down the north hallway, that's what we want them to do. We want them to say as much as possible because we want the rest of the building then to be able to assess the situation, knowing that, okay, that's, that's all the way on the other end of the building, we're going out on this side of the building, or it's very close to our classroom, what's going to be our response, maybe we need to bury it. So that's, that's going to be the change, and that's, that's a pretty significant shift. You know, this year I'm sure we're, we're going to probably call a hold and secure in every single building sometime this year. You know, unfortunately we'll have, uh, you know, a, a student faint or um, something happen where uh, we'll have to just want to secure the building. That, that will be pretty common occurrence. So that is not something to really elevate everyone's anxiety about. It's just we want to be able to secure hallways and entrances. Uh, but conduct our day as normal. It's going to be the options based, the active threat. That's when we're, we're sharing details. So when we talk about options based, it's run, hide, and fight. Uh, do, you, do you want to maybe share what, what we mean by run, hide, and fight? Certainly. So when we're talking about running, all of these things that we're teaching to the staff and the students basically follow human beings' natural instincts in a crisis situation to uh, fight or flight or freeze, right? So running, uh, running, we're basing it off of the natural instinct to flee the area. Um, what we're at, what we're requiring or asking of the staff at this point is to make that decision. If the active threat is called out, if we're here in the PAC and it's called out on the other side of the building, we have the opportunity to leave the building. So the teachers or the staff members that are with the students are going to say, "We're going to leave through these two doors. Let's go and gather everybody up and." flee from the scene, flee from the building, okay? Um, one of the things that we have to get through to the teachers at this point is we're not concerned with attendance roles and making sure that you have your students and not somebody else's students. We're concerned with leaving the scene. We're concerned with getting away as quickly as we can. Um, one of the things that we teach them when we, te when we, when we talk about running is we're not running from here, running out to the street and stopping. We're not running from here, turning on the parking lot, and running as fast as we can straight through the parking lot. 
unfortunately, you know, life life has led us to the point where we need to teach people to run an invasive pattern. So we're teaching them when you run, you need to flee the building, you need to do so in an invasive way. So we're teaching zigzagging patterns, putting barriers and obstacles between you and the building or you and the threat. So one thing I'd like to add to this is one of the questions we got from staff when we talked about running and, and uh, as Officer Hughes said, you know, it's not about taking role, it's grab all the kids and go. Um, you know, one of the questions was, well, where are we supposed to go? And we, we have said to them, go wherever you need to to be safe and for your students to be safe. That could be several blocks into a neighborhood, whatever it will take. And another question has been then, well, how are we going to account for who's with us? And, you know, I can tell you that we've had lots of conversations law enforcement at school. We will take however long it takes to account for everybody. Um, and we would much prefer to account for, you know, everyone out in our community and neighborhoods and trying to track everyone down. Uh, that, that would be, you know, that's what we're encouraging is that running is really probably one of the best options if that's the first option available. So the hiding portion is kind of like what we did in the past with, the, with an emergency lockdown where we would have everyone keep quiet, lock the doors, move away from the doors. We're shifting things though. Uh, in the form of hiding, we're, we're teaching the staff and the students to barricade the room now. What we found in the past is that if we can put as many obstacles as we can between us and the threat, we're safer than if we just put everybody in the corner and wait until someone comes to help. So part of hiding is also barricading. We're moving tables, desks, chairs, things like that, tying off doorknobs. Uh, the teachers have all been through their rooms. It's, we're in the third week of school now and looked at, do my doors open outward? Do they open inward? How would I barricade this door? I've been with the district for nine whole days now and I have fielded a deluge of, of questions on, my, on specific rooms and how do I do this and what about these windows? Um, and the basics of it is, of, of hiding is, get the doors closed, get them locked, put as many objects as you can between you and the threat and then prepare yourself to, if, if possible, run out of the building, and if absolutely necessary, transition into our last, our last slide here, which is fight, okay? Um, with the fight, we're, what we're teaching is we had, how many instructors do we have for? 12, we had 12 police officers here, um, some dressed in, in red man suits, um, and we were lining our staff up and teaching them how to control a handgun or control a long gun with somebody who's entering a room, how to position themselves on either side of the doorway, how to take somebody down to the ground and swarm them to pin them to the ground, disarm them. Um, how to, if that's not possible, how to distract them by using any improvised, we improvised weapon possible. Um, one of the things that I talked a lot about with the people that came through mind was uh, using improvised weapons we went over and how something as simple as doing a food drive and having canned goods in your room could be a, a fantastic improvised weapon if needed. Um, so we went over all this with them. We made sure that, that when the staff went through that, that was the longest portion of training. Uh, we wanted to make sure that before anybody left that room that they were comfortable with, with understanding what we were teaching them. Um, and I think we put about 450 people through this training, and the last time that I talked to an instructor about it, they said they had maybe three people that said, I can't participate, and two of them were pregnant, and one had a medical condition. So we had a phenomenal amount of, of support and participation from the staff on this. And the feedback has been very positive, empowering, um, to feel like they have some options as to how to respond. Um, so how are we preparing the staff? Well, we, as Officer Hughes um, alluded to at the beginning of the school year, um, as part of our staff in service, we get the end of the day, and I, I have to give um, a, a tremendous amount of gratitude on behalf of the school district and our community to our local law enforcement, um, because they, we didn't pay them to do it, they volunteered, um, it was more than 12 officers, 
Twelve officers just in the counter yeah. yeah. We had about two dozen. Yeah. Two dozen officers for an entire day to conduct training on how to uh, how to verbally de, de escalate situations, uh, how do you barricade rooms, how do you assess your situation to barricade, how do you perform countermeasures. Uh, they they really were phenomenal partners in this whole thing. But we spent that day going over those types of situations. What are the countermeasures? Doing barrier drills, sharing some cognitive drills. Here's the situation. Boom, you're in this in this particular environment. What are your options? And we did that because, quite honestly, um, particularly for teachers and, and our educational staff, no one got into this profession feeling like that was something they'd ever have to do. Um, again, the, unfortunately, times have changed. Um, and it's important that we empower our staff to, to do what they need to do to secure their safety and the safety of kids. Uh, but they can't do that unless, you know, I love that saying, well, if I can't go, the client hasn't been. It's impossible to expect yourself to do something if you haven't even thought about it. So that was why we felt it was really important to kind of go through that training, um, and even doing just cognitive drills. But we did have to understand our audience. As I said, the teachers did not sign up, you know, they didn't sign up to be police officers. That wasn't what they signed up to do. So we wanted to um, kind of nudge them along, empower them, help them feel like this was something that they could accomplish, and that really they have options. And the only option that is unacceptable is to do nothing. And then if they broke a window, you know what? The district's okay with that. If they broke a computer in, the, in their efforts of barricading something, we're good with that. And, and that was really important for them to hear from leadership, from law enforcement, that whatever they need to do to secure their safety and the safety of kids, they have, they have our back. Um, so the other part of it is we have, we're going to be talking to, to students about what does this options base mean? What does home, home secure mean? Uh, so we, we're very understanding of that audience. Uh, that message is going to be very different um, depending on which level we're, we're talking about. So currently, by the end of this month, our people services, so our school psychologists, our counselors, they're working on putting together information to share with elementary through uh, middle school age kids. And that message is very different, and even when you're talking that range message to kindergartners is going to be very different than, than say, fifth graders or fourth graders. Um, it's going to be very different compared to an eighth grader or a high schooler, right? Because what their um, role in the response is going, to, is going to be different. So one of the things that uh, we, you know, I'm going to share a couple just examples of what slides or what the information might look like. Uh, you know, for our younger students, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be safe and what are all the different things that we do to keep ourselves safe. You know, when you go swimming, you wear a life jacket to keep yourself safe. Um, you follow the crossing guard. Just kind of setting the groundwork that even this options base is just part of a lot of the things that we do in life to try to keep ourselves safe. Um, you know, we talk about wearing bike helmets as a way to be safe. So we want to make sure that we we're in in non-threatening language, that we're sharing a message that we do, we do fire drills because we want to make sure we're prepared to be safe. Um, and we're going to do some cognitive drills around if there's a bad person that happens to come into the building, what are some of the things that we might do. And at the end, you know, what we're going to really kind of emphasize with our younger kids is that is the, the message of staying calm, um, listen to what your teacher says, Follow those directions, you know, and kind of thinking about how do we move quickly, lock doors, and if the teacher says we got to push the desk this way, those kind of things, or how do you hide? Um, this, I will tell you, this is not my first time moving towards this approach. In my previous district where I was superintendent, uh, we moved to the options-based approach too, um, and many of those elementary teachers, when they talk to students about this is what we're doing, it was more about, okay, Kids, here's a situation. Tell me where you might hide in this room and how we can spread out and hide. Okay? Um, we're going to really also uh, encourage kids to, again, trust their instincts. If, they, if something seems off to them, particularly our older students, if they, if they see something on social media or they hear kids kind of talking about something that just seems strange, to let people know that that's okay. Um, our kids today are online quite a bit. 
uh, whether it be a phone or a computer or whatever, uh, they're exposed to a lot. There's lots of communications that, you know, I'm a parent and I have to admit there's a lot of commu communications that have occurred with my kids and their friends that I can't even come close to knowing, right? And, and that's going to be the same for all of you. Um, as much as we try. So what we want to do, though, is we want to make sure that kids uh, feel secure and safe to be able to share things that they find um, that, you know, disturbing or troubling to them. That they're sharing it either with you and your then relaying that message, or their teacher, or their principal, uh, or even law enforcement, whoever it might be, so that we can, uh, we can address those issues. When we start to talk about the older students, that's when we're going to probably talk about run, hiding, and fighting. Uh, you know, if we're talking about an eighth grade student who already weighs 175 pounds, we might be soliciting their help in, in how to secure the door or being a two or three person team to, to try to do some counseling. Um, and in some cases, particularly in high school, in my previous district, we did, uh, we did training with, with high school students and high school students saw demonstrations on how to do countermeasures following a teacher's direction, and then we even have a couple participate in that as well. So um, again, I know that that's nothing any of us ever want to hear or ever even think about having to have our, our, our children be part of, but as a parent, um, I think it's really important that we um, have a certain level of honesty with our kids and that we we empower them, just like we're empowering the teachers, to make sure that they're safe. Okay. Yeah. So, the one thing I want to emphasize with this is, there's nobody here that's advocating that this is an option that we go to unless it's absolutely necessary to preserve their life or the lives of the students in that room, okay? So we're not telling you that we're going to have your 15-year-old jump in with us because someone's walking down the hall with an arm with a handgun. But if they're in a room and that person starts to gain entry to that room, we want those students to know the ideas and the concepts that we're teaching everybody so that if they if need be to preserve their own life and the lives of the other people in the room, they can help that staff member to subdue this person until we can get there to help. And at the end of the day, really, again, running is, if everyone could run, if there, in every, any situation like that, that's what we would absolutely advocate, obviously. Um, but in some cases, that may not be the case, and we want them to feel empowered and at least have an understanding of, of what some options might be. So, as I said, um, that message, that information to be shared with students is going to be very different based on the level. And I know that um, from my previous experience with this whole thing, you know, that that is a pretty significant concern. Uh, we want, we actually have some sheets here. Uh, when that came from um, Mental Health Institute, I think in Colorado, uh, about how you talk to your kids about fear and scary situations. Um, so that's the link there. This will be available online as well um, if, if you have any questions. Uh, when, we will send a communication out. So when we're going to have those conversations with, with kids, you will get a, a communication from the school saying, Here's the plan. This is when we're going to start having these communications. We're going to encourage you to be prepared to have conversations with your kids. We'll give you some resources just like this so that you're prepared at home as well. Um, but do understand the driving force here is about life skills. Um, it's about empowerment. It's about uh, getting your mind around how to assess the situation and what are my options. It's not about fear. That's the last thing we want to push because, quite honestly, uh, typically when you're in fear, most people freeze, and we don't want that. So, uh, a couple of takeaways is that this will continue to change. We don't have all the answers, 100% of the answers. Law enforcement will tell you the same thing, that as situations change, as we study these things, they continue to evolve, uh, but that the only thing that we won't accept is no action. We're going to continue to work on preparing um, students and staff. One of the things that we're going to do is have cognitive drills. So we do fire drills, we do tornado drills annually. Uh, by state law, we're actually required to do active threat drills also. Um, the way we would do that, uh, one of the ways we're considering doing that is just cognitive drills. And what that means is we'll pick a day, staff will be given a situation, 
sit down with their classroom and say, okay, um, here's the situation, what are our options? And that's really, again, just getting, getting them to kind of think about what are potential ways we can barricade or what's, our, what's the easiest way out of that particular room. Uh, and again, we're really pushing that safety really is everyone's responsibility. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that we will, uh, we will gladly investigate concern and find out it's just a misunderstanding. That's, that's good use of our time. We're okay with that. And then I, I really do want to emphasize, you know, we, we do this just like we do with tornado drills, right? It's worst case scenario. Um, but I think we would be irresponsible if we didn't have plans and do training uh, to secure school and make sure that they're safe. But at the end of the day, even when you look at it statistically, um, we just have to remember we get news so much faster than we did 30 years ago. Um, but at the end of the day, schools are safe, your schools here are safe, and there's a lot of good people in the buildings who are making sure that they continue to be safe. 